his performance or if it was really trying to make a connection of you know his leadership and his involvement with the people's revolution mm -hmm. and to ensure that um, you know people understand and know who the leadership is and so i think reporting is definitely necessary because of just what has mm -hmm. happened but prior to this um, with other people and to protect like at the end of the day people are still putting their lives on the line you guys do this as a as a job but this is something that is fearful for a lot of people to have themselves exposed in mm -hmm. such a way. He has a family, we have families, we have lives. We just want to make sure that at the end of the day, you know, accountability is met. We're not here to hurt, harm, or cause any danger to anybody at all. And I don't think that's been something that's been the case. And so just wanted to make sure that that's understood. Well, I mean, he's a pub you're a public figure and people are interested in who you are. I think that's the bottom line. I think you probably are multi-dimensional, like everybody. There's probably a lot of different things about who you are. Mm -hmm. This is one aspect of it. Um, I'm interested in the history of the GDs because I used to be a reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and I was covering crime for a decade in the 90s, and they came up all the time in the 90s. So gotcha. I'm pretty familiar with Hoover, Larry Hoover and the history of the GDs in that era. Mm -hmm. And so it was interesting to me what you put on Facebook, and, mm -hmm. you know, how you identify as a GD and just the history of growth and development I mm -hmm. thought was interesting. So we, we started to look into that and then we felt it was important, obviously, to hear your, your side of that and to learn more about you two so we're not just looking at one thing about mm -hmm. Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. You're clearly one of the key leaders of the movement in Milwaukee, so it makes it newsworthy and interesting to people. Well, I appreciate the, the, the backdrop of yeah. how the story came about. Yeah, that's how okay. it came about. Right. Like, Sounds literally good. how it came about. Okay. But, I mean, they came up all the time. I did a story <clears throat> on the murder mob back in the day. I don't know if you remember that. It was in Metcalf Park. A little Park familiar. With the yeah. Crinton. And that was probably 1995. And so, it's interesting. But we uh -huh. can cut to the chase. That's yeah, kind of yeah, the preamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's <laughs> do it, you know. Yeah, let's do yeah, it. I think yeah. it'll be um, I think it'll be a positive story to learn about the history and to learn more about the present and uh and how things have evolved um mm -hmm. from there so uh so yeah let's let's okay. let's shoot to it so you have questions so so um i guess i'm just gonna start by asking jim you can dive yeah. into like right. uh, mm -hmm. we work together on this stuff but um I have you're a journalist history. too i am okay yeah i have the long history in it through the journal sentinel so i sometimes take the I start the interviews, but um, and this will be published where our our website, Wisconsin, right now. Okay, yeah. and that's um, Northern Wisconsin, or well, well, the whole state of Wisconsin. Yeah, state. We cover a lot of Milwaukee issues. Yeah, we were in Louisville, so yeah. <laughs> we did that yeah, too. Did. We were in Kenosha, yeah. so <laughs> we were in Kenosha. Yeah. 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 So about how many um, readers or subscribers? Um, well, we're new, but we've had like maybe three hundred thousand since we started, and that was a month ago. That's yeah, in our first month, yeah, yeah about three hundred thousand page views, mm -hmm. about. 200,000 visitors in one month. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. So let's get to yeah, that. Let's get to <laughs> it. All right. So, mm -hmm. so let's just start with um, how you see growth and development and like what it means to you. Mm -hmm. And then you have this going, so I don't have to take detailed notes, yep. right? Because right. right. I, I want to be able to talk to him and not. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. How do you describe, how would you define, describe growth and development? Yeah. What is so, it? So, so I learned about growth and development at the age of about uh, 17. Um, um, at 15. And how old are you now, just I'm for 34. perspective? I'm okay, so quite right a few now. years ago. Yeah, okay, so, so a few years ago. Okay. Um, and when I, you know, first learned about like the history of street organizations, um, it's what the government know as gangs, right? But before they were known as gangs, they were known as street organizations, and it kind of branched out of this whole civil rights. Black Panther Party uh, movement, you know, as the Black Panther parties was dismantled, um, that's when street organizations emerged. And you had many different types, uh, you know, Blackstones, uh, you know, Vice Lords, you know, uh, um, uh, Black Gangster Disciples at the time. Um, these were the original street organizations that were founded. You know, then you had Bloods and Crips in different areas on in uh, the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, West Coast and East Coast, still street organizations, but but all of them formed with the establishment of um, ownership in the community, um, um, uh, community identity, and the, and the culture of blackness. Um, in the same way like that with the Hispanic street organizations formed with the understanding of protecting their community, ownership and identity with a history of culture. Um, 
because at the time, you know, we was communities was ex still experiencing police brutality. Police were coming into communities, beating up neighbors, beating up residents, etc. So these street organizations emerged out of the concept of taking care of one another, protecting the community, etc. Um, what ended up happening in the history, and then I'll get to how it sure. how it applies to me. Um, but what ended up happening in the history of street organizations, um, of course we know about COINTELPRO, we know about the mass amount of drugs that were flooded into black and, black and brown communities, and that's what created the, this, this form of gangs, my territory, your territory, right? Don't cross my territory, don't cross your, this, this territory. That was the gang mentality that ended up emerging um, from COINTELPRO um, with this mass amount of dope and heroin, and, and, uh, and, and other drugs that were um, distributed through the community. Um, I wasn't a part of that. This was way before my time. Um, so in understanding growth and development, um, in 1982, um, uh, the chairman, Larry Hoover, um, came up with a new concept, and it was a concept of organization. Um, and it took away the old concept, or it not took away, but it evolved um, this old concept of gangster disciple mentality, right, of the gangster disciple nation, um, and evolved it into the growth and development um, uh, lifestyle of organization. Um, of course, a lot of people did not honor and follow that uh, that memo. You know, a lot of people still to this day um, uh, claim to be part of gangster disciple nation. Um, but in true teachings of GD. Then, uh, then all was supposed to emerge from the gangster disciple lifestyle to the growth and development lifestyle, which was about education, economics, uh, political uh, development, social development, um, organization development, and unity. Uh, what are what are what are points of growth and development? Um, so, when I learned about growth and development, because at 15 years old, you know, I knew about. You know, obviously, you know, communities, you know, GD Vice Lords, et cetera, in my community that I grew up in. So um, I, I closely identified more with GD um, because it was just everybody that I knew around me at the time growing up as a young kid identified as that too. Um, so at 15, I thought it was about gang banging and that lifestyle. And two, I um, ended up going to Marshall High School. And um, one of my teachers, um, she asked the whole class, she said, who are all a part of um, some gang in here or some type of, or, and, and like everybody was raising their hand from the block like 2-7, I'm KOB, I'm this, I'm that. And I was like, well, you know, um, I'm a part of an organization. You know, um, you know, she was like, well, what's that, GD? She was like, well, you know, if you don't go to school and you don't maintain the 2.0, you can't be that. So it was her who really made me interested and learn, learn more about, well, what is growth and development? So at 17 years old is when I really learned about growth and development and it really changed my life. And that's why I don't have a problem with saying, hey, I'm, I'm growth and development. Because when I say I'm growth and development, I, I, that means that I have made the transition, right, in my lifestyle from a negative way to a more positive way. So for those who are a part of um, the teachings of what the, because Larry Hoover, you know, obviously he's, um, he's paying his price of, things that he's done in his past and things that others have done in the name of GD. Um, but what he's saying now is don't be like me. Don't live my life. Don't go down the same mistakes that I have went down. Right? Eradicate the negative behaviors and turn it into something positive. So when he put the memo out and then when he made it about education and economics and social developments and politics and that was, that was, that was something that was very passionate to me because uh, deep down in my heart, I've always really been about community and social justice and things of that nature. Um, so when I was 17, I remember um, uh, when I was originally um, um, learning about growth and development, we ended up going to this church. It was called Amazing Ministries on uh, 55th and Burleigh. Mm -hmm. And uh, we walked into, and, and, we, and before we walked in, we were talking about doing a community cleanup. And we was like, well, how are we gonna do this? We don't have no support. We don't have like nothing. We was just 17, maybe like 17, 16. Um, so I knew the I knew um, the pastor and a couple of people. Well, no, I didn't know the pastor yet. I think no, I didn't know nobody from the church yet. But we decided to go into this church. And uh, I remember when we walked in, it was about like maybe five, six of us, and uh, they all stopped. 
they stopped the service and they was like, how y'all doing young man, you know, what brings y'all here? And we was like, well, you know, we're trying to do a community cleanup, you know, we, uh, we're just looking for support, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I remember the whole church embracing us uh, at that moment and then the whole church coming out and doing a community cleanup with us. And like, that was, the, that was, that was my start of growth and development. Um, and that's how I really uh, uh, begin to identify with the teachings of growth and development. So that's really interesting. Um, yeah. Do you believe that the gangster disciples exist today, or are they growth and development? It's the same thing. No, it's not. It's not. It's uh, it's, it's a difference. Um, you know, gangster disciple is a mentality. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's an old way of thinking. Um, growth and development is a lifestyle. It's a transition from the old to the new. Um, but it's the same organization. What, what, what it's the same. It's founded on the same principles, right? Of of GD, um, and of course, every everything has a history. Um, but the history has, but the but the present has changed from the past. Um, so so now, when, when individuals talk about your against a disciple, um, those who are in the true teachings understand that that's not the way. That's not the way of uh, of GD anymore. So those who still continue the old process of Gangsta Disciple are those who continue in that lifestyle of selling dope, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so in, you would call them gangster disciples if well, they're well, doing crime and dope and all that. I mean, that's definitely that's definitely the the the, the identity that Gangsta Disciples had, right? Mm -hmm. um, but growth and development is a, is a completely different lifestyle. It's a completely different thing. It's a completely different practice. Um, but founded on the same principles of organization that uh, that it originated when uh, back then in the beginning before they were known as gangs before the dope the drugs and everything came about I think the idea of growth and development is to take things back to the basics of community of involvement of um, you know uh, ownership uh, protecting your community right being being an example in your community holding yourself accountable in your community I think that's what growth and development is. Uh, to me and to many people who practice underneath the teachings of growth and development. So, or go ahead. Would you, do you reject and condemn then gangster disciples? Oh, absolutely we you, do. You do? You know, we let everyone know. So like right now, um, I was born in 1986. The new teachings of growth and development came in 1982. Just like I say, hey, I wasn't around when gangster disciple was in existence. I came when growth and development was in existence. The problem is a lot of people aren't familiar with the full teachings of growth and development. So when they hear GD, they automatically associate GD with Gangster Disciple and the lifestyle that Gangster Disciple had at that time. Um, but even at that time, it was still positive things going on, but it didn't overshadow the negative things that was going on uh, inside of the organization. Um, but growth and development um, is a whole new identity. It's a whole new practice um, to, that takes on the identity of GD. So we talked to Larry Safer. He's the he was the lead prosecutor who put Hoover in federal prison mm -hmm. back in the nineties. And we also asked him kind of the same questions. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to tell you what he said and then tell me your take on that. Mm -hmm. His his opinion is masks are like cumbersome. Mm -hmm. Um his opinion is that um, growth and development was a front mm -hmm. and that Larry Hoover wanted to get parole at that time and it was created as part of an effort by him to get parole and um and that it was that he created these community organizations as an you know an, an effort to get parole and it's sort of a community pr rebranding approach he believes it was a fraud to cover a front because he said they have weeks of tapes of larry hoover in state prison talking about drug deals and homicides and things like that hmm. and that a federal jury rejected the idea that growth and development had sort of shed the old way, mm -hmm. that they were still doing drug dealing and homicide, mm. even as he was talking about growth and development and creating that concept. And so Larry uh, Safer's opinion is that, you know, the way Larry Hoover ran it was, was a front and a fraud. Mm. Do you, what's your reaction to that? Well, like I said, I think uh, growth and I think growth and development is uh, is a completely different practice. Like growth and development saved my life. Um, okay. You know, when 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 I think about growth and development and the environment that I came from, I could have been doing the same thing, but I'm not, right? And I'm and I'm not because of the, the the teachings that I learned about growth and development. So can I say that it applied to all people? I can't speak for everybody, right? But because everybody is their own individual, right? Inside of the organization too. Right. So 
just like everybody say, okay, well, all cops ain't bad. Okay, so, you know, all people who who's a part of the GD organization isn't bad too, right? So, so I think we, I think there must be a clear distinction um, in terms of practices and in terms of the history of uh, of those who have been involved with criminal activity and those who are not. And, and I think that's the difference that uh, that growth and development is trying to make. And and and, and even um, in regards to uh, Larry Hoover. Uh, you know, I think I, I truly believe that when he developed the understanding on the concept of growth and development, that he wanted those younger people be, who was coming up the pipeline to not follow right the path of before. Right? I think I think a lot of people understood the bloodshed and the and, and, and the things that came with that way of life, and I think they truly did want to eradicate that type of behavior. And I think it's people like me, right? who is an example of taking on that concept and people like, and, and other people um, who practice the concept of growth and development, who has taken on that concept, who is that example of what Larry Hoover uh, did want to birth when he came up with the understanding of growth and development. Because, uh, because it did make a difference in my life uh, compared to Gangsta Disciple and growth and development. You know, I think to me there's a completely big uh, uh, difference um, in terms of the two and in terms of who decides to practice what. So you, you believe what he wrote is the point. Like he has this blueprint oh, yeah. and the manifesto, the vision. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about what the vision means when people say like on the vision or the vision? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, vi the, the, the vision is, uh, is, you know, for one, you know, uh, he talks about, um, you know, taking on the role of professional um, um, jobs, right? So uh, going to be a doctor going to be a lawyer, going to be a, a school teacher, going to be something of importance in your community, right? That's the vision. Um, the, uh, the, another part of the vision um, is he talks about uh, sustainable community economics, positive community economics, becoming a business owner, becoming an entrepreneur. Um, that's part of the vision. Um, the other thing he talks about, and he talks real heavy of it, is um, recidivism and not going to prison, not ending up like me, right? That's part of the vision, to change the young people's lives who are in the streets right now who are taking on that identity of Gangsta Disciple or whatever other street organization who's practicing the negative um, ways, right? That society, right? Because, I mean, truth be told, you know, they didn't bring the, the, the boatloads of dope um, to America, right? We know that the government, like, it's proof that the government has did this and have dropped it in black and brown communities, right? So for struggling people at this time in the 60s, 70s, you know, that was an identity for a lot of black Americans um, to make it out of the struggle, to make it out of that barrier. Um, so that's what that was, right? And then of course, you know, we have the, you know, you know, uh, 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 COINTELPRO and things of that nature that once we give it to you, okay, now you're a criminal, right? So. Uh, I don't, you know, I can't speak on all of that. I can speak on what growth and development has done in the lives of many young people, right, and including myself, um, that has changed our dynamics from being that uh, to being an activist. So you know, it sounds great, right? Like literacy mm -hmm. jobs. Like Absolutely. What, what Hoover wrote sounds great. Absolutely. The issue, I guess, going back to is that people think he wasn't living it out as he was creating. Like he was still running a drug operation. He was still, they were still doing homicides. And they claim this is proven with weeks of tapes of him in prison talking about these things. Yes. And the jury convicted him. How do you square that? Yeah, I can't speak to that because I don't know about that, right? I can't, I can't speak to information that I don't know about, right? But does that bother you? Does I mean, so, so, so one of the things that I know in my life is that you have, to, you, you, you have to believe in something, right? And in my communities, a lot of times, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have doctors and lawyers and, you know, people in my community, right? You know, so, so, so anyone who's willing to change your life in a positive direction is okay in the community because even, okay, so it's like, I can, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not applauding uh, any of the doping and murder of, of, from any individual, but I think what it is, is if an individual can say, hey, don't be like me, right? Take this path, right? I know you heard about this, but that's not the way. Take this path. I think that's more important than saying, yeah, continue to do this, continue to do that, right? Because that's, that's not what was taught to me. You know, that's not, nobody came to me and said, hey, let me give you this, let me give you this gun, and you go out there and do that. No, people said, no, you need to stay in school. No, you need to do this. No, you need to do that. And that's what shaped my teachings in growth and development. 
So I think there's, I think it's two, I think it's two sides. Who taught you growth and development? Well, the well, teacher I, that you mentioned, right? Well, what well, the teacher told me about how you had to stay in school in order okay. to maintain um, um, being a part of the organization. I didn't know that at the time when I was 15, 16 in high school, freshman, sophomore, you know. So a teacher told you in order to stay in growth and development, you had to stay in school? Yeah. I just want to make sure I heard you right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Te right. A teacher told me that at Marshall. That's interesting. Um, and when she told me that, I was like, you know, I didn't know that. Because um, I was never part of like any block games, you know, two seven or anything like that. And I think that's also the difference when we talk about the other organizations, I mean, other things before in the 90s and things that you was covering. We're, you were talking, we're talking about neighborhoods who took on the identity of being XYZ, right? But it wasn't right, like in, the murder. They were neighborhood neighborhoods. Neighborhoods, I think. Absolutely, at that time. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the difference, right? Because in the in the teachings of organization, we're all in the teachings of growth and development. So for those who choose to operate in a different facet, they're operating in their own facet, and a lot of people still do that. You know, a lot of people still, you know, hey, I'm from this block, I'm this, right? And you can't necessarily force anybody, and that's the, the difference between growth and development and gangster disciple now, right? This is not a, we're not forcing anybody. This is for those who are willing to take on the teachings of growth and development, not those who are forced um, to take on the identity of GD. And that's the difference between the two. So when you say GD, it has these different identities, right? Like clearly there's some people probably still doing drugs and killing people mm -hmm. who say I'm a GD. Or I'm a or I'm a, a vice lord, or I'm a right. crip, or I'm a blood, right. or I'm a police officer. But right? you're arguing that other people adopt this other side of it. That Hoover, absolutely. Like Hoover absolutely. Did, yeah, and absolutely. And live it out a different way. Absolutely. Why I still use the symbols, the star, the um, PML, NCL, mm -hmm. like the lingo. I mean, it means pretty much love. You know, you know, you know, I've organ you know, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the foundation of um, GD when it originated, it originated out of the principles and the concept of love. It was love, life, loyalty, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, right? So those concepts uh, are still true. You know, to stand on love, to stand on life, to stand on loyalty, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Those concepts are still true. Um, it's, the, it's the negative connotation that went with the stars and the symbolism. Um, even when you th uh, look at the pitchfork, it means mind, body, soul, right? It's not a devil symbolism. Um, but for those that don't know, don't know. Because it's a negative uh, identity that's been associated with it. I'm going to throw this star, or I'm going to throw this pitchfork, and I'm going to go kill somebody. I'm going to go sell this dope in the concept while I do this. But for those who are in true teachings with it, it's a whole different lifestyle for those who really practice growth and development. Why do you need growth and development still? If you want to be a community activist, preaching literacy, doing cleanups, and like you do a lot of good things mm -hmm. in the community. That's mm -hmm. obvious, right, from news stories about you and Ernie. Why do you need growth and development? Why do you need the symbols, the lingo, the identity of the of what what was the game? It's the street, you know. And I think, and, 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 and if we're following the vision, then the vision is to go get them, right? And to bring them back, and to bring them into the teachings of growth and development, right? That's the vision. Don't fall down the path of indictment. Don't fall down the path of criminality. Go get them. And teach them the true teachings of growth and development. That's that, that's what it is, right? So if I'm a mentor and if I'm a, a activist and I and I notice people in my community who say, oh man, on the G or oh GD folks or whatever, no folks, you, you you know that mean this, right? You know that mean you're supposed to be taking care of your business, right? You know that mean that you're not supposed to be XYZ, right? That's 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 it gives it gives accountability to those who still practice the old way. So, so it needs it needs to be there because because people who are on the street need to transition from that lifestyle. They need to transition from the old way to the new way. And I think that's where uh, the uh, the purpose of uh, Larry Hoover's vision was to say, yeah, I was, I don't know if we're still in it or not, but I might still be in it. But don't follow me, right? Don't go down my path, right? Here's a whole new lane, a whole new a whole new blueprint for you to follow. So if you want to take on the identity, take on this identity. And not that one. Do you think he should be freed? I do. Why? I do. I mean, Why? he's been locked up uh, for over forty something years. Um, you know, when we look at uh, a lot of political prisoners, um, you know, they all have faced the same judgment at that time. And then this was a, this was an era of Cointel Pro when masses of drugs were dropped into black and brown communities. We know this to be true. 
right? Um, you know, this was a time of, uh, of, 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 of black activism when it was at an all-time high and when black act activism needed to be dismantled, right? We know this to be true. Um, and I think now we're in a phase where um, communities need a voice, right? We know that in the city of Chicago, violence is at an all-time high, and a lot of people are still taking on the concept of GD, but they have no leadership. They have no voice. They have no one to say, hey, we're not doing that anymore. Now this is what we're doing, right? And we also know to be true that when, um, when the dope dealing and all that stuff was going on in the black and brown communities, um, the federal government didn't come in and indict anybody at that time. It wasn't until 10,000 GDs showed up in the city of Chicago to vote that they became a problem um, for the federal government. Right? That's the truth, right? So, so there were recent indictments, like that you can look it up and there's indictments in 2020 for mm -hmm. drugs, racketeering, homicide, like all over the country, GDs. Some say, like there was an Atlanta indictment where they were talking about growth and development and saying they believed that and the feds were saying no, they were doing all this. How do you, what's your reaction to that? Like how do you pull that apart, you know, when some people are still saying I'm a GD and they're going out and they're doing crime, allegedly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for the most part, I can't speak to uh, individuals and individuals' cases. Uh, I, I'm not them, right? I, I, I can speak to how growth and development has impacted my life and, and has impacted the lives of others that I know uh, personally, um, who have made people um, who, who are from the street think twice before they pull the trigger. You know, uh, people who probably who were selling dope think twice before they go out and sell dope now and say, man, I'm just going to get a job. Because growth and development is one of those things that's important to their lives and they truly want to practice that. So, that, like, I know that life. I know that, that side of the story. Um, so that's the side of the story that I can speak to. Um, you know, the fact that someone like me can write uh, uh, two books, um, you know, and, and be a published author and develop curriculum and be a, a, a social entrepreneur inside of the school districts for over 10 years. That's what I can speak to, right? But it's because of those teachings that held me accountable to say, no, 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 we're not on that no more, right? We're on this. Let's talk more about your positive things you've done and also um, maybe just start, if we could start from square one about like just your bio. Mm -hmm. well, I wanna learn more about you so we're not mm -hmm. just only talking about this. Like you were, you were born in Brooklyn? I was. I read that in an article yep. somewhere. Yeah. And then when did you come to Milwaukee? When I was one. Okay. Yeah, I came to Milwaukee when I was one, my mom and my sister. Okay. Yeah. And what did your mom do? For uh, well, my mom, she was an order filler for J.C. Penney's for about 15 years. Um, did a little work at the post office, um, and then eventually uh, ended up doing some work over at uh, Frederick Hospital. Um, so she's always been a working woman all my life. Um, you know, we started off uh, when we first moved here. We was on uh, 27 in Clybourne. Um, then we moved over to the south side of Oklahoma. And then eventually she uh, ended up getting her house over on 54th and Burla. You know, finished raising us there uh, for the rest of our adulthood. Um, so always been a hardworking, independent woman. You know, strong, positive. Never been on drugs. Never, never, never drank. Um, uh, you know, always uh, 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 did the best she could to, to raise us the right way. And what about your dad? Uh, my father was um, my father was um, um, facing. Um, a life sentence. Um, when I, well, when I came to Milwaukee, he was extradited to Wisconsin, and that's how we ended up getting to Wisconsin. Um, wow. So what was my, his name? Uh, Carl Estrada. Carl. Um, how do you yep, spell that? Uh, C A R L E S T R A D A. Okay. Um, and you know, and just in all transparency, uh, you know, my father. Uh, was a fugitive for 11 years. Mm -hmm. um, he escaped the Walpon prison underneath the alias of Lamont Coleman. And that's really how I got mm -hmm. the last name Coleman. Okay. Um, other than that, nobody in my okay. family last name is Coleman. What did he, if you don't mind me asking, what did he do? I think he had a homicide, uh, a homicide case um, at the time. Um, was and, he a GD? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, no, okay. No. That came later. Okay. Uh, no, my father, my father, I'm not, I'm not sure what, what street things was around back then. He was, uh, my father was, his, my father was born in 19, my mom was born in like 61, my mom was, my father was born 
He's 20 years older than my mom, so. Mm-hmm. He's born way before 40, that. 40, 41, roughly? Damn near, like yeah. 30 something. Okay. Like yeah. So, so he's gotta be, is he still around? He passed in 2015. Okay. Yeah. Um, that must have been hard on you as a kid. So I didn't know, I didn't know my, I didn't know um, much about my, my, my father's side uh, mm-hmm. growing up. Um, my mom, when originally, she used to take us a visit. Uh, my father in Racine, uh, when he was extradited, they ended up taking him back to Racine. Um, and then she ended up stopped. You know, I remember being a kid, she used to say he's in school. Um, you know, she's always been like a very mm-hmm. low key type of person. Um, but then she stopped and she stopped taking us to the prison. She didn't want us. You know, I remember her telling us she didn't want us going up there anymore. Uh, so my father ended up getting out on parole in 2000 and I think 10. Um, so it was the first time that I met my father outside of the prison walls. Um, and at this time, he uh, took on the identity of, uh, of Islam. Um, so um, after learning about my father, um, you know, he, uh, in, in prison, he started, uh, well, before he went to prison, um, he had a, a bread, milk, and, cu- and, a bread, milk and uh, cheese uh, trucking business out of New York. Uh, a printing company uh, mm-hmm. out in New York uh, underneath the Elias and uh, he was uh, a prison inmate guard uh, on the buses um, oh. out of New York um, and then when he got um, extradited um, in prison he ended up creating um, a few state programs uh, for for the prison um, and then you know just kind of really like teaching a lot of uh, guys who was in the prison about Islam okay. um, so that's how uh, I ended up learning more about my father on that side. Uh, so that was in like 2010, so I had about five years kind of, you know, to spend with him outside of uh, prison. Okay. How know, did all that, that, all of that, I mean, that's a dramatic story. Like, yeah. How did that affect you? I think, you? Um, I think, I think uh, a lot of it, a, a lot of it um, caused me to look for identity, right? And I think that's how I, be, how I took on the identity of growth and development. You know, because you know, part of it was um, a connect was connecting to a cause um, that was deeply uh, important to my life. And social justice has always been important uh, to me before I even knew about you know a lot of the major protests and you know all of this stuff. Sure. Um, so you know, once once going through that experience, and then you know, just kind of growing up, you know, a lot of my friends, uh, my the, my first friend, um, that I lost to gun violence. He was 15 years old. I was 15 years old. Um, his so name? his name was David. Was the last uh, name? David. Uh, oh, what's his name? Robinson. David Robinson. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, David Robinson. Um, so you were with him when he was shot? No, 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 okay. no, no. But wasn't with him. Um, so like gun violence and social justice has like been very personal mm-hmm. with me. Uh, you know, just kind of losing a lot of friends in high school, a lot of friends going back and forth uh, to jail and prison. Um, I knew at an early age, uh, around 17, that, uh, that, that I know that my life needed to be different. Um, and, you know, that's when I started reading uh, civil rights books. Um, I went to six different high schools, just kind of bouncing back and forth, you know, just kind of looking for, you know, my own identity. Um, but I took on the understanding of, you know, of, of self-education and self-knowledge and, you know, I started reading a lot about civil rights movements and how street organizations uh, was a major factor in the civil rights movement. When Martin Luther King went to Chicago, uh, uh, he had the disciples, the Lords in the stones uh, protect him uh, in the protests in Chicago. Um, and street organizations has always taken on the identity of activism and social justice before they took on the identity of gangs. Um, but when I learned about all this stuff, um, you know, then that's when, that's when it became more personal for me uh, to, uh, to practice in the same lifestyle. And that's why growth and development is so important to my life and I think to so many lives of uh, other people. How many people have you known that were shot to death or killed oh, man. or murdered? Over 10. Wow. Yeah, over 10. Over 10. Over 10. How many yeah. of those when you were really young yeah. and high, and high Most school? of them were when I was, most of them were when I was between the ages of 15 to about 20. Five. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them. 
Because you grew up in like Maybe the heyday of violence in Milwaukee, like when there was the most. I mean, most definitely. I you think, grew up uh, in you the know, middle. Milwaukee is a very, very violent, right. you know, uh, 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 segregated, mm -hmm. uh, impoverished community. And I think uh, when we look at the disparity gaps in terms of employment and unemployment, uh, you know, we know that those gaps are major in, uh, in the city of Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we know that mass incarceration is major uh, mm -hmm. in the state of Wisconsin and the majority of those numbers come from the city of Milwaukee and, uh, and, and even the state of Wisconsin has more uh, incarcerated numbers than other countries uh, across the world. So we know that this is a, a spot where you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Um, so the ability to be able to make it out of it, right, mm -hmm. uh, in a positive way um, is very important to a lot of people. Um, and, and, I, and I think there's no secret for, I don't think there should be any secret for people to know um, what helped me mm -hmm. uh, make my transitions and, and, and to be a, a better person. Um, I, one thing before I forget to ask you this, is your name Kalila or Khalil? Khalil. It used to be Kalila, right? No, it was an uh, era. Um, I was uh, went through the criminal justice process one time and, you know, oh. they ended up putting an A at the end of Cause it. Because I read that uh, in the Journal Sentinel, there were these yeah. old cases. Yeah, I yeah. think they're old, Yeah. right? Yeah. But it's old under cases. Kalila. Yeah, yeah. What, what happened with all that? Yeah. You don't want to dwell on it. I mean, all that's, all that's dismissed. It was a long know? time ago. Yeah, what? all that's dismissed. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, uh, mm -hmm. you know, little small petty things, you know, nothing major. Okay. You know, nothing major. You know, definitely uh, most of my arrest has been from protesting. You know, I think I've been arrested more times from protesting than anything else. Um, you know, so, you know, nothing major, you know. So, um, can you tell us some of the positive things you've been involved in? And I wanted to ask about, you know, the protests and all that too, but um, first, can you tell us more of the activities you've done that are positive? Mm -hmm. Like, you mentioned um, education, you've done things in education, your books, like, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. you wanted people mm -hmm. to know mm -hmm. about yeah, absolutely. positive things you do. Yep. I mean, you know, uh, I started the uh, first violence prevention um, um, effort in the city of Milwaukee in 2015. We uh, introduced a safe zone initiative. Um, it ran for about two years, 2015, uh, 16, and in 2017, that's when um, the 414 Life uh, was adopted. Um, and uh, they came up with the care violence model. Um, but, but, but we first ran the violence prevention models on 27th and uh, Burlock uh, was one zone, and 27th then Atkinson was another zone. Uh, we reduced uh, non-fatal shootings 80%. Uh, we reduced homicides uh, about 60% in, uh, in, in both neighborhoods. Um, it was a, a grassroots activity. It started, uh, the, the, the concept of safe zones came out of the protest um, of Dontre Hamilton. Um, you know, we was all arrested on the freeway, about 74 of us. Um, you know, they asked us what we wanted, you know, we, you know, you know, I was pulled out of my jail cell and, you know, kind of came up with the idea of uh, safe zones. And at the time, it worked in three ways. We had uh, violence prevention, uh, which was the, what we called uh, hood ambassadors, which still for helping others obtain direction. Um, we had community policing, which was uh, 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 pretty much uh, having police um, um, check in to communities when, uh, when they are, just, are, uh, are patrolling neighborhoods. They would have to check into uh, uh, safe houses, and uh, there was a red flag system and things of that nature. Um, and then there was community corrections, uh, which was pretty much about um, alternatives to uh, incarceration. Um, so all three of these things were proposed um, to the city of Milwaukee, uh, the police department, the district attorney's office. Um, but uh, at the time, one of the things that we was able to get started right away was uh, was the Safe Zone Initiative Violence Prevention Model um, with uh, Alderman Asante Hamilton uh, was the first one to invest $50,000 into uh, the Violence Prevention Model. Then uh, uh, our second year, we had uh, 75000 I think the county um, invested um, like 30000 or something like that. I think we had a total of like $112,000 the first two, uh, out of the first two years. Um, so, so I did that, um, you know, again, like the books and curriculums and things like that. I've been, uh, I sold over thousands of books and, and curriculums uh, from, you know, uh, Milwaukee Public Schools to um, Green Bay Area School District, um, St. Book, Charles, the books. The, the school yeah. districts are buying your books? The school districts, yeah, okay. the school That's districts, um, Green Bay, 
uh, St. Charles, um, Seton Catholic School District. Um, I have created a peer mediation and violence prevention um, at Riverside High School and uh, throughout the, um, uh, the district of uh, MPS, mm -hmm. uh, where I train students to be peer mediators and train staff to sit in circles and, and uh, conduct peer mediation uh, talks to prevent violence and suspensions after the federal investigation came against MPS uh, about um, uh, the disparities and suspensions between blacks and whites. Um, so that was one of the models that was uh, also implemented. Uh, we was able to reduce uh, fights. Uh, I think those that went through peer mediation, um, it resulted in no fights, about 90% of them. Um, so that's those been things, uh, uh, models and programs that I created. Um, Do you talk about growth and development to the students? You know, not necessarily. I don't. Um, you know, I think uh, I don't. I don't speak on really growth and development. Um, I, I apply to all aspects of my life, um, but I don't really speak on it uh, really unless I'm speaking um, to those who say that they identify uh, with the concept of GD. Oh, okay. um, because to me, it's more of my way of saying, okay, well, if this is what you identify with, then these are the practices and, uh, and, and, and the principles um, you know, that you should align with. So, so today, like, what um, would you what would students. you say is your job? Like, how are you making a living? You know what I mean? Is I mean, I'm a social entrepreneur. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I'm contracted. You know, all of my work for the past ten years, I've been uh, self sustained um, as an entrepreneur um, by my work inside of the school districts. Um, so, uh, so I still work uh, doing that, uh, okay. doing that work. So, uh, you know, the only thing that's preventing me now is the COVID stuff. You know, with the schools and everything being right. closed, I'm not able to go inside of the classrooms. I'm um, just over the summer. I was doing virtual reality classes with uh, Green Bay um, School District, uh, two schools out in Green Bay. Um, so, you know, right now with the schools just kind of opening up. You know, just kind of giving them some time to, you know, get through the first one or two, uh, you know, then normally that's when my contract start, you know, for the remaining of the year. What would you call, what's the, con what's, uh, what's the program called that you're teaching? Changing school? Lives Through Literature. Changing Lives Through yep. Literature. Yep. It's a, okay. it's a, um, a sole proprietorship that I established in 2010, um, and that's what I use to help publish my books, uh, Time and Place and Life. So you made that concept? Yep, I made that. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. okay. Um, Oh, before I forget, tell me about Ike Taylor and mm -hmm. his meeting in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. which we mentioned. Yeah, earlier. yeah. So, um, so we had the opportunity to uh, officially meet um, Ike Taylor. Yeah. Um, you know, he was uh, one of the uh, original founders of BGD uh, at the time. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, he shared with us was uh, how proud he was of the concept of growth and development, um, how he too um, is a believer in the concept of growth and development, um, and pretty much, you know, uh, giving us an understanding of the old way um, versus the new way. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, and, and a lot of these older guys, uh, you know, uh, Duff Clark, you know, you guys mm -hmm. mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, rest in peace to, to Duff Clark, he passed, uh, I believe, last year, mm -hmm. um, you know, have become mentors. Um, to a lot of the younger guys who teach the younger guys uh, the positive ways of growth and development. Um, you know, a lot of these guys have did their time in, in, in state, federal penitentiary, um, and they're out now, and a lot of guys are coming home now. And, um, and, and, you know, I can't speak for everybody. You know, I can, you know, really only speak for myself. But, um, but for the most part, a lot, of these, a lot of the older guys are coming home and want to be mentors to the younger guys to, to show them um, another way other than the ways that they went, you know, a lot of these guys lost their whole lives, you know, lost families, lost friends for 19, 20 years, you know, and, uh, and, and, and I think a lot of what growth and development is about is not making those same mistakes. Did um, I talk about the protest movement or no, anything No, like no, that? no, 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 uh, you know, uh, he don't, no, 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 he don't get involved in that type of stuff. Oh, he no, 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 no. Um, and like even Black Lives Matter, like uh, like I'm not a I'm not in a group of Black Lives Matter, right? Like I proclaim Black Lives Matter because because uh, I know that to be true, right? I know my life always mattered. Like I, there was never a time in my life where I ever felt like my life didn't matter, right? So when I say Black Lives Matter, I'm not uh, representing the group or an affiliate uh, to a group. Um, and I think that's one of the misconceptions as well. Is that a lot of times when people hear Black Lives Matter. 
they tie into the Black Lives Matter group. Why don't um, you want to be part of their group? Well, I mean, I mean, it's politics, you know. I'm not <laughs> really into, you know, too much, you know, uh, uh, red tape politics. You know, I'm a, I'm a grassroots activist. Um, you know, a lot of my work is just very organic, you know, just working with people from the community, you know, working with people from the street. Um, you know, same thing that I do in the classrooms. A lot of my, you know, mostly all of my classes around, you know, uh, literacy, reading the book, and, 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 and after reading the book, uh, developing uh, social programs or some type of community service program for the school and for the students okay. um, to participate in. So it's around civic engagement. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, groups, Etc. And, and you know, even when we talk about growth and development, it's not even really the group for me. It's the teaching for me, right? It's 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 the belief. It's the blueprint. It's, it's the, the belief. It's the yeah. It's the vision, right? It's, it's the, the it's the belief for me more than it's the group, right? And I think for a lot of people, I think a lot of people that identify with growth and development identify with the belief and the teachings of growth and development. And the leader, though, too, right? Like, well, I mean, you know, I mean, at the end of the you day, support, would you say you're a Larry Hoover supporter? I mean, I mean, I, 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 I would definitely say that I'm a supporter of uh, of the teachings of growth and development, you know, and that came, you know, and that came from, you know, Larry Hoover, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to get into the politics of, okay, well, if you're a supporter, then you must support X, Y, Z. No, right? I support growth and development, okay. right? And I support the concept of growth and development, and that's what I support. Oh, the, or, the Black Lives Matter organization, not the concept, because mm -hmm. I think we can agree there's two separate concepts, yep, there right? Is. I think we can all agree on Black Lives Matter as a concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everyone should agree Black Lives Matter. Right. Black Lives Matter. Is it? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, right. it's sort of a simple thing to say. <laughs> right. To be able but to the say or, sometimes there's a clash between the idea of Black Lives Matter and the organization yeah, itself. Yeah, it is. It's a misunderstanding. Can you yeah. comment on that, on, on what your thoughts are on the actual organization itself and what they're doing? I can't because I don't know. Like, I never met anyone from, uh, from the Black Lives Matter uh, organization. Um, I know that there's a real organization out there, I hear that it's established around, uh, you know, of course, Black Lives Matter rights, a lot of LGBTQ rights. Right. Um, but I can't speak to that because I don't know anything about it. You know, I, don't, I only know of the, of, of the concept mm -hmm. of uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, and, that's, and that's, you know, pretty much saying that, you know, yes, all lives matter, but all lives can't matter until Black Lives is included in that all lives. Um, and that's what we mean when we say Black Lives Matter. So I can't really, okay. you know, say that. Um, you know, and I, and I, I would assume that's what the organization believes too, uh, but that would just be an assumption. What about Antifa? 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 Yeah. Antifa? 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 Yeah, no. <laughs> good for you. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, how about the People's Revolution? Yeah, Are you yeah. part of them? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I mean, you know, the, I mean, that, that, again, that's a grassroots um, um, effort. You know, it started off as the peaceful protest. Um, you know, the New Milwaukee, um, you know, kind of emerged to the People's Movement. Um, and then, you know, kind of emerged some more to the People's Revolution. And uh, I think out of the concept was, uh, you know, we want to see change in laws, right? We want to see, you know, it's bigger than the protest, right? We want to see real uh, substantial, substantial change um, in government, uh, and that would include laws uh, being changed, being introduced, and even some being removed um, that protects uh, police officers uh, when they violate breaking policies and breaking procedures, and it results in situations of death or homicide. Right, so that's what the People Revolution is. It's a it's a it's a, a group of individuals um, who come together to protest and march every day. Um, a lot of us don't know each other. We just met each other over the past 100 days, um, and you know it has emerged into pretty much like this organic uh, wave of of activism. Um, you know where people are taking on roles of uh, PR. Uh, people are taking on roles of um, uh, uh, demands and listening to uh, residents as we go through Wauwatosa or as we go through Milwaukee or as we go through Shorewood, Whitefish Bay, um, and listen to the concerns of what people want to see in terms of police accountability and taking those concerns uh, and creating demands around that. Um, so, you know, we have committees around uh, that. We're, we're talking about... Um, ideas of uh, um, 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 uh, art galleries and being able to showcase 
uh, pictures and, and, and footage of the movement from day one and, and all of the beautifulness that went into the protest and uh, the beautiful individuals who's a part of the protest. Because a lot of times when you see the protest and you just see a group of individuals who's labeled as X, Y, Z, but you don't know the individuals um, who's out there, right? A lot of teachers, a lot of uh, professionals, a lot of social workers, um, a lot of people who, who work in uh, um, some type of wellness uh, capacity um, are protesters. Um, but a lot of those stories aren't told uh, in the larger media. Um, and I think that's what kind of puts the stigma on the protest is the fact that we're not highlighting individuals uh, or, uh, who are participating in these protests. Would, um, would you say you're a leader of the People's Revolution, a founder, or just I'm just, indi you I'm just an individual, you know, who, uh, who has a voice just like many other people um, Did you in help the movement. found it? I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an activist. I've been an activist. I've been, I've been an activist. You know, it's not new for me. Um, so when, when the movement started, it started on activism, and, and those who are a part of it, um, just took on the same identities that I have. You know, in terms of the protest. Um, so you know, I think we're, we're all a voice, right? You know, my voice alone doesn't make up the group of hundreds of individuals, thousands of individuals. Um, so we all have a voice inside of the movement, inside of the revolution, inside of the activism community um, and making sure that that's being uh, put out there. So one thing Larry Hoover talked a lot about was, I think, incarceration mm -hmm. and prison reform. I think he was in the vision, right? He was yeah, the that's right. of like prison reform. Yeah. I mean, are you getting some of the things you're seeking from his vision? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like hmm. some of the specific policy changes you want? Do they come from that? No, it doesn't. Um, I, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, again, like, um, like I practice growth and development, right? So mm -hmm. it's not something that I uh, necessarily go run to this book and go read and say, okay, let me go implement it like this, right? Okay. It's, it's, like, it's, it's, it's a way of life for me, right? So um, just being in the way of life, um, certain things are already um, second nature um, to do as, as an activist. Um, so when we came up with our demands, our demands were strictly around encounters in the community as we've been protesting for the past 100 days. So what do you want uh, to see change, like specifically policy? Do you, do you support defunding police? I mean, I would, so uh, again, yes. And when we say defund police, it means taking the police budget and reallocating it to other services and other programs. Um, it's not like take this money and just leave it right somewhere and it just collect dust right no like a lot of city budgets are half uh if not more than half of the city a lot of police department budgets are half if not more than half of the city's budget right? and that's a lot of money and when we talk about violence and, and the increase in violence we 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 know as as violence interrupters um who have intervened in violence um who's, who have been front line when guns have been pulled out and have been able to talk people down from shooting someone, right? We know that the police are an aftermath of, of, uh, of uh, effect. Um, and oftentimes come when things have already occurred. Um, and a lot of times there's a mistrust in community and policing. So a lot of people don't even call the police or when they do call the police, they're treated like a criminal when they call the police, right? So when we say defund, we're talking about, let's cut more than half, right? The, the, the city budget should not, the police department budget should not be half of the city budget. Right, we know that there are other programs and other important entities um, who's connected to making sure that communities are sustainable, making sure that communities are thriving. Um, that need more help. That needs more funding. Um, when police officers are called to a mental health situation, you're showing up with weapons, right? Your baton, your taser, your gun, but you don't have the experience and the expertise or the patience, right, to talk someone in a mental health crisis. You should show up with a social worker. You should show up with X, Y, Z, right, physician or whoever to help come up with better practices um, when 911 is called. Yeah, yeah, police officers show up, but show up with someone who is trained in that profession to help the police officer deal with that situation so things are being de-escalated and not um, increasing, you know, you buffing up, now I gotta buff up because I gotta show you I'm a police officer and I gotta show you that law and order rules, right? It shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be 
you know, me versus you, right? He said, we, what can we do as a collective and as services um, to have better um, outcomes when 911 is called? So we can talk about the, the mental health part. There's a lot of issues there, but there's already a Milwaukee County Mobile Health Crisis Unit, mm -hmm. right? That that can respond when someone is in the is in is in crisis. Mm -hmm. How realistic is it to say we're going to have a police officer? And because usually it's the nearest squads that respond to someone mm -hmm. if they're suicidal or, or whatever. Is it realistic to say we're going to have all these trained counselors or therapists riding with every police officer, every other police officer no. squad, 24 hours a day, no. all day long? I no. mean, in terms of budgets, it's no, right. not realistic. In terms okay. Of time, so, terms so of how power. do you, how, how no. would you, I guess that's the question mm -hmm. is how do you explain having therapists going with police officers on every mental yeah. health issue? So, 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 I, so we should identify. Um, um, a certain amount of officers who are trained um, already in de-escalation, right, who are trained already in mental health, who is assigned, um, you know, maybe one or two squad cars is on duty during this shift, who has a therapist with them, riding with them, and these are the ones that respond, right? Not all, not, not all of you, okay. but the ones who are assigned with the therapist, one or two, three squad cars per shift, mm -hmm. right? Um, should be the ones that, was, that are responding to those 911 situations. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about some of the other issues? <clears throat> um, reckless driving in the city has obviously become an issue. We need police officers out there doing traffic control. Mm -hmm. Do you agree we need police officers out there? Okay. Yeah, traffic control and investigating homicides and shootings. Absolutely. We absolutely. have to absolutely. have a police department. Absolutely. So how are we going to dig, and I'm asking you this not to come at you, but this is a question a lot of society is asking. How are we going to um, address all the issues that like the city of Milwaukee has in crime, but yet take away a large portion of the funding to do that? So there's a large portion of funds that are uh, that in the police budget that are um, that over, well, it has to be spent by the end of the year. Um, so there's a large portion of the police budget um, that go towards um, military equipment, that go towards desk furniture, um, things of that nature. I mean, what was that, or, uh, desk and furniture? So I just, I just wanna make yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I asked okay. for forfeitures. Um, oh, okay. You know, Got well, it. things that are collected um, during seas. Um, you know, that all can be used towards reallocating towards services. And I think that we're, we're just not talking about that, right? We're talking about, you know, just as, just as money that the mayor is saying, hey, here you go, right? But there's a whole lot of other um, pockets of money that can be reallocated in ways that go to the best interest of the community and not pocket uh, the police departments. Um, you know, with more funds and more funds and more funds. Do you support cutting officer positions? You know, let me make sure I'm answering this question correctly. So repeat that again. Like, I'm wondering if you support reducing the number of officers on the streets, like cutting uh, officer positions, or uh, either through not filling them or cutting them, I guess. What I think is that, um, there's a lot of money that is used and misused um, in the police departments that needs more accountability. Um, not necessarily say how many officers should be. We know that sometimes we know one officers, you know, a year makes up almost a hundred thousand dollars or something to that nature, right? That's one officer. That's a lot of money um, for an officer uh, a year. Um, I think there should be. Um, insurance and things that's attached to being a police officer. A lot of lawsuits, a lot of um, um, civil cases, when police officers do wrong, um, comes out of the city budget. Um, it should come out of the police department budget. It should come out of the police officer's pension. It should come, uh, as a police officer, you should have insurance. I, so, so I'm a vendor, I'm a professional vendor. I have to have general liability before I walk into a school. $100,000 worth on the low end. As a police officer, why don't you have to have some type of general liability for if things go wrong, right? Money isn't just constantly being wasted and spent and wasted and spent from city budget to police department budget. 
there needs to be more transparency and more accountability. And, and I, you know, I'm not exactly 100% sure of what that looks like right now, but I think that's what we're in the process of trying to develop uh, as, a, as an activist group. Right. Just a, with discussing liability, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the city of Milwaukee itself is its own insurance company. But other mm -hmm. police departments, they actually have insurance companies mm -hmm. that pay out for lawsuits and things like that. I believe the city of Milwaukee is different, but that's just how they chose to set it up. Correct. Um, so, I mean, I think there is, you know, liability insurance already in place for officers through the city if there's a lawsuit, right? Gotcha. Okay. Um, gotcha. And that comes out of the city budget. The, the, the largely for police officers. You want to talk about city, city of Milwaukee, and I, I don't have my facts on this. My understanding is, do you understand, it, do, are they self, self-funded? <laughs> okay, not, their pension is self-funded. I'm not sure. We'll have to look into that. Okay. I honestly don't yeah, remember yeah. offhand. Yeah, let me know, know. Yeah, let me know you, uh, if you find um, out. Yeah. Is but, it, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Nope, go. Um, I guess people that oppose defunding the police are worried crime is going to Let's just be honest. Like well, crime is going up now. Right. And police officers' uh, budget of, has increased and increased and increased. They've kind of increased. stood back, though. Have uh, they? Have they? Uh, well, well, why, why, why about the police stand back? Like, it makes no sense, Because they're right? worried about being the, you know, on the, the next person. For the past the five years? I mean, come on. Right. I mean, I mean, we, I mean, we have to be honest, yeah, I right? I crime know. is going up across the country. Why do you think Police budgets up? have been going up every year. Every year. We understand that, the, that the, you can give the police 100,000, 100% of the budget. It will not deter crime from happening. It will not prevent crime from happening. The only thing that deters crime and prevent crime from happening is thriving communities that have ownership, that have interest, and that has investment to it, right? We know that police officers, most of them aren't even residents of the city that they're policing. So there's no investment in, in that. We're, we're talking about a community that, 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 that distrusts even picking up the phone, calling police officers. So it doesn't matter how much money you give them. If the community is not invested in the police department that is serving in their community, crime will always continue to increase. It's simple. So what, what do you think, why is crime going up? Because obviously homicides, it might be a record year, you know, or headed that way. I mean, what, we have, we have a broken community. We have injustice, for one, right? We still have, we're dealing with this COVID-19, right? A lot of people are out of work. A lot of people are struggling still, right? Um, we still have drugs and things on the community. That's never gonna go anywhere. That's gonna always be here since day one. The government put it here, it's gonna be here, right? So we know that people are still invested in that. So as long as we have these things, and we have property. I mean, we have, we have, we have uh, 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 um, oppression, we have, as long as we still have that, where people feel like 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 somebody's foot is on their neck, right? And even if it's like in physically not, right? It's this notion that there is. People will always continue to feel like their back is against the wall. And when you have people who, who live right next door to each other, normally it doesn't matter if it's black on black or white on white. Normally people take violence out on the closest people who they live around. And that's what's happening. I think some people feel the focus on police, like there's so much focus on police right mm -hmm. now by the protest movement in society, that it's obscuring some of the real issues. But even or what else is causing the disparities, as you point out, police come in at the tail end, mm -hmm. yet they're getting the lion's share of the blame for mm -hmm. all this. So, <laughs> Like what, do you see what I'm, where I'm having? Yeah, 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 I see like, exactly what you're saying. Like, you you feel like that the protest is stopping, is, some or, or preventing, some people feel like that yeah. the protest is deterring police officers from being able to do their job in a more effective way. Oh, or just also that it's just scapegoating them for problems they didn't cause. I mean, it's twofold, right? Because a lot of people are saying the reason why they're out protesting is because they have a distrust from the police already. Right? So this is way before the protest, when someone did call 911 and they was treated like a criminal for calling 911. Or when they called 911 and the police showed up 45 minutes later, right? Or they called 911 and the police didn't show up at all. The response times are terrible. Now. So it's like, yeah. we're not talking but, about, like, this is not no scapegoat. Like, this is not a scapegoat moment. This is an accountability moment. This is a moment where people are saying, hey, there's a real distrust with police, right? Or with the system, not individual officers, right? Let's be clear about that. People aren't mad at individual officers. People are upset with the system 
and, and individual officers you just got to take the blame because they're working for that system. So it's, it's, it's messed up on both sides of the spectrum because we have officers who have done nothing wrong, right, but take on the ownership of, being, of, of a job, right? And they're taking the blame for this system that's always been in existence way before they took on this ownership of job. But, but what about homelessness and... Poverty. Yeah, talk and to the mayor. Literacy, right? Yeah, talk to the mayor. Who's to blame? Right. For the, 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 the leader, leadership. It's a terrible city leadership. Disparity. I mean, the, yeah. it's it's outrageous that. But you don't see that in Shorewood. Right. You don't see it in White so Bay. To blame? But these are blocks away from each other. We're not talking about across the river. I'm not talking about across the ocean. I'm talking about blocks away from each other. What makes my community different than theirs, what, right? What, what do you think? Well, we know. Well, well, I know that there's, I know that there's structural racism, right? Every black community that I go to across the state, I've been, I've been in New York, I've been in Baltimore, I've been in St. Louis, I've been, a, I, I, I've been, I've been a little bit of everywhere. I've been in, in Chicago. Every black city across America looks identical. They look exactly the same. Why is that? But then when you go to the sub. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? What, what's well, the well, well, we know that racism is, is, is a factor. But, but that. we've got a black city attorney, right? It doesn't we've, matter. We've got a we, black police chief. We've got black aldermen. Yeah. We've got, that doesn't matter, you think? It, it, it doesn't necessarily because we're talking about the system, right? Again, we're talking, those are individuals. We're talking about a system, right, that starts at the state, that trickles down to local, trickle down, trickle over the county, right? And these are just individuals who are taking on the profession to work for this system. What about Tom Barrett? What's your reaction or opinion of him? Well, you know, I think, um, I think, you know, our mayor has been in position for 20 years. And when you look at the disparities and when you look at the poverty and when you look at the issues that black people have been dealing with in Milwaukee, it hasn't changed. This is 20 years of leadership, um, and nothing has changed. Violence hasn't changed. Potholes hasn't changed. Right. So it's not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. A, oh, I don't. I think the mayor's a bad person. Or I think the mayor's a good person. It's not about person personality. It's about leadership. It's about effectiveness. It's about moving us forward. Right. So we can have better relations in our communities. I mean, I think everyone should agree the disparities are wrong and terrible. Mm -hmm. The question is how you solve it and who's to blame for it, I think. One of my concerns is because Barrett has been in office for almost 20 years and things have not improved in the black community. That's right. Why aren't you holding his feet to the fire? Why aren't you organizing and why aren't you getting him kicked out of office and get some true leadership in there? I think that's a question a lot of the rest of the state of Wisconsin would like to know is why do you continue to bring these people in that aren't helping you? I mean, you know, I... I would say for the past 20 years, people have tried to run for office. Um, black people, brown people, um, there is a system of power that exists. There's a level of uh, finances that exist in politics and in, in elections. And, um, and a lot of times our communities is left out. A lot of times our community gets the short end of the stick um, when it comes to the finances, when it comes to uh, uh, voting, voting suppression, uh, when it comes to things of that nature, um, I, th I think people try. I think there's a, and, and, and this is why people are, you know, um, want to see so much change happen is because people are tired of the same, the same old thing. But, but if you keep on electing the same people, but a lot you're going to get the same thing. a lot thing. of people aren't, right? A lot of people aren't. And I think even just this last election that just happened when uh, Senator Lena Taylor ran, you know, and how they did the voting polls in the, in the inner city, you know, to close <laughs> how many of them and left three, four. But again, that was Mayor Barrett's well, decision. So, so again, that's, that's, that's an executive decision to disenfranchise or to reduce voting uh, turnout in certain communities. So, you know, we're, we're, we're still talking about tactics here, right? If I'm the mayor, I, I have that authority to do certain things that can help push the ball forward in my corner. And, and so, so we're still dealing with politics here. And I think a lot of people on the ground, um, you know, they, they have the ground level ability to go out and vote. 
But, but when we're talking about political packs and when we're talking about finances and raising funds to, to actually be able to introduce someone else to run for these offices, Senator Taylor had nearly the amount of money that Mayor Tom Barrett had when she when she ran against him, right? So these are all of these are like it's all a factor. You know, and I, I think people would love to see change. White and black people and brown people included. But I think there's so much uh, money and business that goes into politics that uh, that just goes over a lot of general people's heads. Why not protest at Barrett's house instead of? We have. Oh, you have. Okay. Almost all the time. I just didn't get. You know, and it's not a, it's not against of... any one particular person, right? It's about how do we bring awareness to these individuals who are in leadership position? You know, hey, you're on the common council. Hey, did you know about this? Do you know about this? What is your stance on this? Hey, you're the mayor of the city of Milwaukee. What is your stance on this? Do you know about this? You know, the, the lead pipe, the, 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 the lead water pipe issue to me is one of the most frustrating failures of his administration. Yep. And it should be how it's affected the black community. And lead-based paint and water is That's a right. huge problem. And yet... There's nothing. been nothing. There's been nothing. I was talking to someone. Um, they uh, they live in uh, Louisville now. Um, they was talking about how they lived in Wisconsin, and the reason why he moved is because in the '90s he was out here and he got sick from E. coli yeah. from drinking water in the yeah. '90s. Yeah. Cryptosporidium. Yes, sir. Um, Love you, brother. I wanted to ask you just a quick couple quick things before I forget. Say we can find a couple questions. Yeah, we just have a cu couple more. Um, tell me, did Frank Nitty move to Atlanta? I don't That's know. One. I haven't heard from him since uh, since we walked. We to heard DC. he, but well, we don't know if it's true. We yeah. heard he moved to Atlanta and didn't come back. I don't know. I think that's a question that you should ask. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> tell me about Ronald Bell. Ronald Bell, Ronald Bell, Ronald the Bell. The guy accused of shooting at Mensa. Oh, I don't know. I, like, uh, he was a protester. Um, you know, I met him during protests. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it was a mistake. You know, I think he, I think he made a mistake. You know, so. What's your reaction to that whole thing that happened? You know, I think, I think it's, it, it was, um, you know, I wish that things could have went a different way. You know, I really do. Um, you know, I, 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 it's unfortunate. I really do. Um, feel bad about the situation, you know, you know, like you never want to see um, people get hurt, but you definitely want to, don't want to see people, you know, lose their freedom um, in the nature of a protest. Okay. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, tension, um, you know, I think that uh, Joseph Mensah could have done things differently instead of coming out the house as well and, and, and running in the alley and, and I think a lot of, I think we, I think we all could have done things differently that day. Were you there? Um, um, I, I was present that day, um, you know, and you know things happened so fast. A lot of stuff I didn't see, you know, you, you, you know, a lot of stuff you just heard, you heard like the third person. Um, so was Bowen there? Uh, Bowen was present. Um, was Bond Mays? I was fine. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I was there. Oh, just because um, we don't have too much more time, do yeah. you want to bring up yeah. Umbrellas in press conference? Oh yeah, sure. So you were at the press conference with Steve DeVugas, mm -hmm. right, a couple hours before Morales. Mm -hmm. I, can you tell us what you want to ask um, Just, you spoke at the press conference. At the end of it, you actually said thank you for questions or we're finishing uh -huh, up or uh -huh, something like uh -huh. that. How did you get involved in being part of that press conference? So I was called by, um, by the chair at the time um, to stand with him as he make an announcement in regards to the chief. Um, again, I have a, a long history with the Fire and Police Commission, you know, with uh, uh, Derrick Williams' case um, in 2011. Um, you know, we marched a whole year uh, in that case and we was able to get a special uh, uh, inquest um, done in regards to that case. Um, a lot of Fire and Police Commission meetings then. Um, and uh, during the Dontre Hamilton case, you know, a lot of Fire and Police Commissions then. Um, but it, it was always an accountability, and I think once we got to this moment, a lot of people were on the side of, yep, policing needs to have more accountability, right? Um, and that's how it was brought to our attention. Uh, you know, the fact that the Fire and Police Commission was being uh, spoken down upon by the mayor at this particular time. I think the mayor wrote a statement or something to the, na to the nature. 
um, about the Fire and Police Commission. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think the Fire and Police Commission, you know, was, uh, was furious about that. And I think they held a lot of things in, um, you know, just trying to respectfully weigh out the process. And uh, I think after the mayor's statement, uh, the Fire and Police Commission was, was, was ready for um, a decision. Uh, and that decision was unanimous uh, to remove um, former Chief uh, Morales. Uh, for the failure and lack of accountability of jo the Joel Acevedo case um, and you know body cam footage that's been requested uh, uh, public records that's been requested um, and just you know uh, violence that's been happening you know in the community you know and just this lack of accountability and I think that's what all went into uh, determination of the of the chief. So I did like two more questions. Mm -hmm. I know they, I'll make them really fast. Um, was was Ronald Bell? Is he a GD? Is he gross? No, Bell? no, 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 no. Because no, he had a not. Hoover thing on his Facebook page. Not that I know of. But no. you didn't know. No. Him. So so he's not a. Uh, um, there's a lot of people who claim right uh, to be, and I, I don't have anything to do with. Like I can't go around policing <laughs> right. the world. Yeah, so you know what I'm saying? He can't speak for other people. Yeah, 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 I can't that's police. Yeah, yeah. But 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 but, but to my knowledge, uh, I don't recognize. Or know him to be uh, growth and development. Were you ever in the gang, Gangster Disciples? I was never in the gang. So the gang was like the whole Gangster Disciple, right? And that was that was, that was established before the eighties. Okay. Um. So growth and development came in in eighty two. Okay. I was born in eighty six. So you well, you so got into no it once way. it was growth. Do you think there was no yeah. gang yeah. after eighty two? Right. It was a, it, it took on a constable organization at that time. So you time. believe right. Gangster Disciples in nineteen eighty two became growth and development? And cease to exist as gangster disciples. That's that. That's with the uh, memo um, okay. of when of how growth and development established. That's how it was established, right? Anything okay. after you know this, this after growth and development, the new concept was introduced in '82. Uh, everything after, I mean, yeah, after '82 uh, was growth and development. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And then right. Elvin Cole. So, so I just want to ask you one this tough question. Mm -hmm. So, what loses a lot of people? is when the protest movement criticizes cops or cases in which at least you know law enforcement are saying that they the person fired a gun at a police officer mm -hmm. first so like in the Elvin Cole case people are saying why are you protesting Mensa when Elvin no, Cole is accused of shooting at him first See, and, and I think, uh, you know, people have been looking, have been asking for public records. They've been asking for the, the, the video. Like, nobody has seen this. The family is saying that's not true, right? Mm -hmm. And there's only one way for transparency. Release the video. Release, you, you release the public record. Is there video? No, there was no body cam. Right? Well, I think that's the your squad, word versus, the squad car video. You know, well, your word car. versus his, right? And, 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 and if you're a police officer, who do you normally well, go with? Well, they found a you know? gun in his hand. I mean, I, I can't and speak to that. there were witnesses that said a person matching his description had it in the mall. I can't speak to that, right? Because I don't know that factual to uh, that fact. Doesn't and, and that so, though? And if so, arrest, uh, arrest him. I mean, it, it, it matters, but arrest him, right? If he had a gun, then he should be under arrest, But right? if he shot at the cop first, but that's not, how can you But that's not proof. That's not proof. Like right. we can't, we can't prove. You can't prove that. I can't prove so you're that. You're not sure that. I'm not true. sure that that's happened. I'm not sure if that happened or not. Right. If it and did. this was one of the issues of body cams, and right. this is why we are in Tosa, right? Because there should be, but all officers should wear body cams. If you're in the field, it shouldn't be my word versus what versus you, right? Because and, and especially, oh, I remember being young. And I'm going, we're going to wrap this up. I had got arrested one time. Um, but it's so I was walking down the street. Like, I promise a guy. I was walking down the street. And the police officers had stopped me for walking down the street. I had a hoodie on. And um, they was like, oh, we got a call that people was walking in the alley looking through cars. I said, well, I ain't even in the alley. I said, read me the description. They said, oh, well, this person had on. They said something about... Um, a blue, blue shirt. I said, I got on a gray hoodie. Oh, we're close enough. This is what they tell me, close enough. I ended up arresting me, taking me down to this district. And you know me, I'm furious. I'm talking all type of, what am I here for? You know what I'm saying? You know. That happens, but if. But, but hear me, yeah. hear me, hear yeah. me. And I'm gonna get back to that point. Okay. One of the officers said, um, we should get bigger calibers. And I'm like, what that's supposed to mean? He's like, cause dead men can't talk. 
This is what an officer said to another officer in regards to me saying, y'all got me down here for the wrong reasons. In Alvin Cole's case, Alvin Cole dead. He don't have a chance to tell his story. It's the dead man versus the cop. That's the problem. That's why body cameras need to be worn. That's why we're in Tulsa, and that's why we implemented, that's why we wanted the uh, Common Council to implement body cams, to implement no chokeholds, no knock warrants, because it would prevent things from happening. We we're in the business of prevention, not let it happen and then we figure it out. No, 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 no. What can we do to prevent things from happening before it becomes a problem? And if the police officers would have had body cam, then it wouldn't have been a dead man word versus a police officer. But he was word. a 17 year old with a gun at a mall. But we arrest him. Your job as a police officer is not to be the judge, the jury, and well, the they, they, they tried to arrest him. He ran away. They would chase him. They did. did, and then he shot at him, allegedly. Uh, uh, you there hear, you go, you can, allegedly. You can hear the gunshots on the video. But, but how do you know that the police officer got it? Yeah, well, they you probably know. tested but, it. But how do you know? But, but, I I mean, but we haven't seen right? ballistics, right? right? I haven't seen ballistics. You haven't seen right. ballistics. Yeah. If it comes out that he shot at the cop, did the cop I can't have speak a on that because that's, I can't speak on assumption, right? Oh, okay. You haven't seen the facts to the, to the gunshots. I haven't seen the facts to Alvin Cole shooting. That's an mm -hmm. allegation. That's a dead man versus a cop. Do so, you, so, do you, so respectfully. Can we, not, can we not get into any more of this because it's sure. still an ongoing investigation? Right, I was going to ask, D.A. Chisholm mm -hmm. is about to announce his decision shortly. We I hope he makes that. the right decision. Okay, do you expect, yeah. um, if there is a decision that goes in favor of the officer, do you expect there to be protesting over that decision? Absolutely. What are you guys protesting do? right now. I mean, people are protesting. I mean, you know, I think, I think, um, one of the things that we heard, and, and, and this is what makes you question if it's really a fair justice system or not. Because we have already heard that the, that the decision is going to be not in favor of uh, charging the uh, uh, Joseph Minson. Oh, you've heard that? From who or where? Exactly. Okay. But why would we hear that if it's, a, if it's, if it's closed? If it's a fair investigation, why would those who are leaked to police departments, leak to district attorney's office, know that information is being shared and come back and tell us. Because no. it's not fair, it's not just. Obviously, we didn't even hear testimony in the Common Council Committee uh, from the mayor, Mayor McBride, um, uh, 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 Chief, Chief Weber, saying that he knew of certain details in the investigation. How will he know of certain details in the investigation if it's supposed to be a closed investigation and his department ain't supposed to know of any investigation details if it's an outside investigation? Right. It's unjust. It is our understanding. The mayor and the chief did see some video. They said something did in that see video. Some video. I remember. Yeah. 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 How do you avoid it becoming Kenosha? What's your reaction to the fires there, the arsons? What the protests turned into something else? Like, I, you know, what I truly what? wish is I truly wish that uh, those who are in position of power uh, listen to those who are peacefully protesting because there's a whole like group of just everyday people who are not protesters who hear news like Breonna Taylor who hear news like Mike Brown and who take things into their own hands we have no control over that but how does right? it help so, how, how's it help your cause you know what people are burning stuff you, you know what that's, that's separate that's separate I can't control everyday people out here in the community who are frustrated and furious about shit that's been happening for years I can't control them I'm an everyday protester. I'm a protester. Just like everybody else. That's what I can control. I can control my actions as a protester. And try to have voice to try to influence others to do the right thing. But I can't control you. I can't force you to do nothing. Right? And I wish that more people just paid attention to those who are trying to do things the right way. Before people who ain't a protester. But you're a leader, and you were at Mensa's But, but I'm a leader of myself. But I am a leader of myself, could, right? Could they have listened to you? But, could you have stopped them from running all over his yard and throwing toilet paper? I'll try. Hey, look, look, let me say, I'm not to blame, right? I don't want to be in a situation where, where you try to blame me no, I'm for what saying, happened in the situation. They might have listened to what, the Ronald Bell. They, I mean, I wish. I wish, right? Because then things would be prevented. I wish. But I also wish, I wish more importantly, that the shit wouldn't have never happened. Right? I wish, more importantly, that Joseph Minson didn't kill three people within five years and he's still a police officer. That's really what I wish. Because then it wouldn't be a situation like, like Ronald Bell. It wouldn't be a situation like, uh, like, like, like what's happening across the country with everything burning the hell up. 
It wouldn't be that if people hold, held the police accountable. That's really what I wish. I just am wondering if the fires, the arsons, the stuff people seeing on TV, if that's helping your cause, though. It doesn't help, but it doesn't. But 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 either way, they're not listening, anyways. The people, people been protesting since when? Five since forever. Small changes gradually, small changes gradually, but still big racism, still big discrimination, still big, I'm gonna murder you because I'm a police officer and I got the right to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner, and I feel like your black life don't matter, so I'm gonna make a decision whether if you live or die. That shit ain't right. Do you I don't wanna live in a world like that where police officers can, can determine whether if I live or die. If I break the law, arrest me, take me to jail, let me go face my jury. Right. That's what I want to see. Same thing if, if a police officer killed. Arrest him, take him to jail, let him go face his jury. And let the jury decide if he violated his policy. Let the jury decide if he violated his procedure. Let the jury decide if he took the matters into his own hands to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner and took someone's life and he didn't have to. Let the jury decide that. Not the same police officers who you work for. That's not fair. That's the type of justice system that I Do you condemn the, the, the looting, the arson? Yeah, we sure do. We okay. sure do. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's not what we're about. Keep that over there. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do that, don't do that with us. Because I'm wondering how that's affecting the business community. Are people going to bring businesses to the black community when they see that on TV? How I mean, is it helping? I mean, it's so messed up. Like, it's so messed up, mm -hmm. right? Because these... these <laughs> the businesses are suffering. They're being... Communities are suffering. Yeah. Neighborhood, yeah. Li like lives are suffering. That's true. Right, like bigger than buildings and and finances. I mean, right, like people are hurting. Lives. Like people are actually hurting. A lot of these families been begging for public records for years. Like, and these are these are things that we pay as taxpayers for it to be to, for it to be public. What gives the police department the right to withhold public information and then cover it up and then tamper with evidence? And then make allegations with my word versus the dead man's like it's unacceptable. Okay. I know they're answering. I know they're, they're, they're <laughs> answering. Sorry, it was very, very interesting. I, we, we had all these questions because yeah. you were very interesting. Well, thank Thanks you. for talking.